Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 8th. Today's topic is Google Search and Chrome Extensions. Your show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Our special guest today is Paula Noggle, who will talk to us about Google Search and Chrome Extensions. I will turn the mic over to Peggy to introduce Paula, as well as to uh, ask the newbie question. Well, hello, everyone. It's so great to have you with us today. And I love our global audience. It's so great when we can connect and collaborate with people from around the world. So thank you all for joining us. Well, as you can tell, I am so excited to have my good friend and education superhero, Paula Noggle, with us today to share her passion and expertise for some amazing tips and tools to help all of us begin to take advantage of the power of Google Search and Chrome extensions in classrooms and professional lives. We love it when we can learn straight from the teachers who are using these tools day in and day out. Paula has been an active supporter and contributor to our Classroom 2.0 live shows since the beginning. She's been a presenter. She's a member of our Classroom 2.0 live advisory team and an active participant in our webinars. Her encouraging comments and many links, ideas, and resources that she shares in the chat for our live shows have greatly enriched all of our lives. And we're so fortunate to have her in our PLN. Paula has just begun her 40th year as an educator this past Wednesday. Currently, she teaches fourth graders English, language, arts, and social studies at Bisnet Plaza, which is a suburban public school just outside of New Orleans. She is passionate about preparing her students for their futures as 21st century digital citizens. They use web tools such as Edmodo, Skype, Google Hangouts, Kid Blogs, Google Docs, and many others to be able to connect and collaborate with other classes. She's presented both in person and virtually at many conferences at the state, national, and international level. Paula is a Discovery Star educator and a member of the DEN Leadership Council of Louisiana. In 2010-11, she was named the Region 1 Educator of the Year for Louisiana. No surprise. She's also a Microsoft Innovative Educator. She's a moderator for several chats, including 4th Chat, LA Ed Chat, and DEN Chat. And she's an Edmodo Ambassador and a Simple K-12 Ambassador. I'm sure many of you have seen her in many of those roles. She's a founding organizer of EdCamp NOLA, and she was just selected to be a member of the LAQ Board of Directors. So we are so grateful to have Paula here with us sharing about her Google Search and Chrome Extensions tips. And we're going to move on to the newbie question, ask Paula to answer this, and jump right into her presentation. So Paula, why do you think it's important for your students to have good search skills? And what tools do you use to help streamline your students' workflow? Well, Peggy, thank you so much for that glowing introduction. I'm sitting here, I think my face is red. But um, I love being a part of uh, Classroom 2 Live, as you well know, and I love sharing. And I think it is important for our students to have good search tools, skills, because this is something that we do. I know I do it on a daily basis. And the more we can refine our search skills, the better that we can locate information that we need, uh, when we need it, instead of having to go through the millions of search results that we can get returned when we were using Google as our search tool. 
Also, through the use of Chrome extensions, I have found that I can help my students do things more quickly um, with fewer clicks on their netbooks or their Chromebooks by having these extensions enabled. And I will explain that more in detail as I go through my presentation. So, let us begin. All right. Okay. Today I'm going to do, um, it's kind of a two-parter. So the first half I will uh, share 10 Google search tips and tricks with you. And then during the second half I'm going to talk about uh, 10 of my favorite Chrome extensions. So it's kind of a two-parter and I'm going to stick to the slideshow first and then I can do some application sharing later to do some live demos. I just find it's easier than hopping back and forth. So bear with me as I go through the slide presentation and then I can do some live stuff and hopefully answer questions that you have as we go through the presentation. So let us begin. Okay, there we go. The slides are changing very slowly. There we go. Okay, first of all, if you want to play along, you might want to have um, your Chrome browser open in a, another window so that you can toggle back and forth if you want to try some of these little tips out as, as we go along. One of the things that um, I found interesting that was 60% of us use Chrome, Google Chrome browser as our browser of choice. And one of the things that I learned when I took the power searching MOOC that Google offered a couple of summers ago is that they call the search, I've always called it the search box, but they refer to it as the query box. And so that was a term that I used and I'm trying to be Google-y by using the right term and calling it the query box. So when, okay. If you know me personally, you know that I am a horrible speller. <laughs> it's always been my Achilles heel. So I love the fact that I can always have uh, a Google window open and if I'm not sure, I can quickly type in the beginning part of it and it will finish spelling it for me. Imagine trying to spell the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious properly. Well, all I have to do is begin typing the beginning of it in and Google finishes it out for me. So I love that feature. I have shown that to my students and it helps them a lot with their spelling too. Fourth graders, you know, are still learning a lot of spelling rules and, and phonetic spelling. So sometimes they have trouble with even the beginning sound, but if they can get the beginning part of it going, Google helps them out immensely. Okay, the second tip is um, knowing about the extensions, the specific domains. Um, they need, uh, our students need to know the difference between .com, .org, .edu, and .gov. When you are doing searches, it is sometimes best to actually do the search with the uh, specific domain as part of your search. So if I was going to do a search for online learning, I might want to do it through the .gov domain. So in the query box, I would type site colon .gov and then the search term I'm looking for. If you just did online learning, you would get millions of hits back from Google. But if you did it as site colon .gov online learning, your search results are going to be significantly reduced and you're going to be finding more academic, I'm sorry, more government type things. If you wanted to know more um, from the field of education, then you would do the EDU um, extension. So that's a good thing to know and to have in your back pocket as a search tip. Okay, also learning how to um, search for a specific file is also um, a great thing for you and your students to know. If I would type in, if I was, um, when I was teaching science a couple years ago, I was looking for something on the water cycle. Well, if I just typed in water cycle, I'd get all sorts of results turn coming back to me. But suppose I was looking for a PowerPoint presentation to show my students, 
or maybe I wanted to give them something for their science notebook, so I would search for a PDF. So in the query box, you would type in file type, semicolon, the letter abbreviation for what you're looking for, PowerPoint is PPT, PDF is a PDF, obviously, and then the search term that you're looking for. And it brings back, like when you do PowerPoint, every single search result is a PowerPoint presentation. When you do PDF, all of the search results are just PDFs. So it's a great way to, again, filter out a lot of stuff that you really don't want to see. Okay, um, one of the things that I am very cognizant of is teaching my students proper di digital citizenship. Um, there are lots of things online, there are people that share, and some people are okay with you borrowing your stuff and using it, and others aren't. And we have to teach our students about copyright. And one of the best activities to do with this to kind of um, get kids thinking about it is as I start my copyright lesson, I start walking around the room and just kind of taking things off their desk and they're like, wait, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, it was just there. You mean I can't just pick it up and have it? And it kind of really drives home the fact that just because it's there, it's not for you. So one of the things I like to teach my students is how to do a search for things that are um, under the common, Creative Commons licensing. So again, you can um, you know, add that to your search terminology. So it's really a great way to get kids thinking about it and to know that yes, just because it's online does not mean it's free for us to use. So one of the things that I'll show you when I demo is how to go down and in the advanced search part of Google, you can actually drill down and get the different licensing in the Google search itself. So that's a great tool to teach your students and also for you. Okay, one of the things that I really like is when that you can filter your um, image results by color. Um, our school has black and white copier and so when I want to put an image on, um, let's say, a, an assessment that I'm doing or a handout that I'm giving my students, I would prefer to add a black and white image to the um, document instead of a color image just so that it prints better when I'm making copies for my classroom. And again, in the, search, in the advanced search part of that of uh, Google, you can change your color options. And again, I will demo, do a live demo of how to do that. Okay, I'm also going to uh, show you how to do the reverse image search in Google. And when I do this one, people are just fascinated by the fact that you can drag an image into the Google image search bar and it will help you locate it. There have been times when I try to always, you know, cite my source, but I'm, you know, quickly doing something on the weekend, getting, you know, something ready for my lessons, and all of a sudden I finish it up and then I go, uh-oh, I didn't cite where I got this particular image from. And I'm like, oh gosh, how am I ever going to figure out where it came from? Well, by dragging the image back into the Google image uh, search box, it will help me locate it, and then I can properly cite my source. I like to uh, connect and collaborate with classrooms around the country and sometimes internationally, so it's always fun to figure out what their weather's like before um, we actually connect with them. So one of the things you can always do on Google is you can figure out what the weather is in any city by just typing weather New York, weather New Orleans, weather Phoenix, and it will bring up what the current um, weather stats are in that area. Also great if you're traveling, getting ready to travel somewhere, you can figure out what's going on. Now I know we're all educators for the most part and we all learn those wonderful conversions when we were in school, but our brains are so full that it's hard to keep in mind all of the different conversions that we might need in our daily lives. So what is really great is that you can just type into the query box 
um, any conversion that you're looking for in Google will find it for you. Uh, if you want to change ten dollars in the euro, you just type that in. If you want to change, um, if you want to figure out what twenty-five degrees Celsius is in Fahrenheit, you can do that. There are so many different ways that Google will help you with conversions. So that's a great tip. And my students love using that in both math and their science classes. Searching within a specific site will help um, students really drill down to um, specific information that they're looking for. Um, if you're doing a, if your kids are doing reports on, let's say, the White House, and they have, you know, some, you know, they're a group, and each group is taking a different part of the White House and going to prepare a report on it. Well, then they can search within the WhiteHouse.gov site by using this example of how to do it. You would type in, okay, I want to know about the Blue Room, and I want to know within the site WhiteHouse.gov. And it would get, you know, it would drill into that specific website and find that information for me. Um, living in southeast Louisiana, sometimes we need to know the recent stats on the West Nile virus. So I can go to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control .gov, and if I type that into the query box, I will get the latest updates instead of having to search through their huge website. So it helps drill down in a specific website. Okay, this is one that works definitely in your um, Google Chrome browser. Um, there is a little microphone next to the query box, right within the query box. Um, you can either click on it or you can just say, OK, Google. And when you say, OK, Google, Google then turns into a speech recognition search. And you can say what you're looking for. This is very helpful, um, and it falls under the guidelines of uh, universal design for learning for our children who are maybe having some kind of um, educational handicap or our students who don't type very well, or our students who don't spell very well. So it really works in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's just great because you're, you know, you're busy and you need a hands-free way of doing a search. So using that microphone is a great way to enable you to do a hands-free search. I, I will come back to this one. I'll uh, explain more about the control F when we get into the live demo part. OK, and then just um, one that I found recently that it, I love using is if in the query box you say uh, set timer for five minutes, you get an automatic online timer that goes and you can display it on your interactive whiteboard and it rings a little bell when the time's up. I use that every day in my classroom to help keep my kids on track. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the term LANYAP, LANYAP is a little something extra that you get. It's a Louisiana thing that I love sharing because when you go to, let's say, the donut store, and you ask for a dozen, you always get landing up, and they give you tw uh, 13. All right, so moving into the uh, Google Chrome extension part of the um, presentation, these are the ones. Uh, first of all, I'm going to explain a little bit about what an extension is for those of you that might not be sure. Extensions are little bits of code that we can plug into our browser which give us some added functionality within our browsing experience. And they show up on your toolbar when they are enabled so that you know which extensions you have avail available for you to use. Some of them you have to click on to use, and some run automatically in the background. Okay. When you are on um, Chrome, the box at the top is the Omnibox, and it is a combination search bar 
or address bar. So if you type in a query, then you're going to get search results, or if you type in a web address, you will, you know, get that listed and you can click on either there. Um, there is a little, um, what I call, I, I actually looked it up because I didn't know what it was called, and it is referred to as a hamburger signal, um, um, icon, I'm sorry, on the right side of your Omnibox. And if you have nothing between the Omnibox and the hamburger icon, that means that you have no extensions added to your Chrome browser or you have not enabled any of them to open. You might have actually added some, but you, at that particular moment, haven't enabled them to be working. So when you actually have extensions enabled, you will see little icons between the Omnibox and the hamburger icon. And you can see that on that particular slide that I had um, when I took that screenshot, I was using nine extensions at the time. Um, here's a little quiz for you. How many extensions do you see open on that screenshot that I took? Oh, and another little tip is, yes, you can click and drag the extension icons around and put them in a different order. If you find one that you use all the time and you want it to be first, you can drag it to the first position. Okay, how do you get Chrome extensions? Well, of course, the easiest way is to go to that web address and um, go through, and of course, there are tons of them. How do I find the ones that I want to use? Well, I either read about it on somebody's blog, or I see it on Twitter, or I just happen to, you know, be with a friend, and I'm like, oh, what extensions do you have open on your um, browser? Let's talk about them. So those are the different ways that I've learned about the ones that I like to use. When you find one that you like and you want to add it, um, I'm sorry, when you want to manage your extensions, you would go to the um, hamburger sign icon, open it up, this window slides out, you would go down to more tools, and then when you click on more tools, another menu box opens up and you would click on extensions, and when you do that, then you get an alphabetical listing of all the extensions that you have added to your browser. You can see that um, if there's a, a check in the box that says enabled, that means that it is currently working on my browser. The ones that are not checked are not open and working at that time. If you add one and you decide that you don't like it or you don't need it or you don't use it, then you can click on the trash can and you can delete it from your um, extensions listing so you don't need to have them. Because I got worried about that. I was adding a bunch and I was like, oh, I don't need all these. How do I get rid of them? So I'm going to talk about these 10 and go over them rather quickly from um, this demo. I mean, from the slideshow, and then I will dem demonstrate them. Okay, the very first one that I believe everyone would love to have is Adblock. It is the number one ad blocking extension. I believe it is uh, available on almost every browser. It works on blocking ads on YouTube, Facebook, etc. There are occasions when you will go to a website and it will say that it cannot properly display the images because you have ad block on. So you will have to go up, click on the ad block um, icon, and quickly turn it off or um, you know, make sure it's not enabled for the time that you want to have that particular website open. It doesn't happen very often, but there have been an, there's been an occasion or a couple where I have at, had to actually turn it off while I am viewing a certain website. That website is obviously being supported by ads, and they need you to be able to have the ad visible, otherwise they're not making any money. But it is still an awesome extension to have, and it does block lots of ads. I remember having a conversation with a teacher, and I was talking about a website I loved using with my classroom, and she said, yeah, but how do you deal with all the ads on it? And I said, ads? I don't have any ads. And then I went, oh, well, that's because I have ad block. 
And she said, oh, well, how do you do that? So I had to show her how to do that. Okay. This one is one I've just recently added, and I absolutely love it. It's called Grammarly. And it is an awesome spell, and spell checker and grammar checker. Um, it is, there are free and paid parts of it. And of course, being a school teacher, I'm leaning to the free part right now. Um, it helps me anytime that I am typing an uh, email, a comment, or a post on Facebook, a tweet on Twitter, uh, update on LinkedIn, anywhere that you're typing on the web, um, most places Grammarly will be there helping you make sure that you are spelling everything right and that you are being grammatically correct. And of course, just keep in mind that no spell checker or grammar checker is 100% accurate. So, but it catches many, 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 many things. Okay? So, I just typed in that sentence just, you know, and I spelled Grammarly improperly so that you could see what pops up when, when you get the red line. And it's very easy and it's quick to use and it really helps me a whole bunch. And I'm excited. I have not used this one with my students, but we will be using it this year. Um, since I had just recently added it, I didn't know that Crammarly sends, sends you a weekly email. And it lists all of the things that you have done for your last week on um, you know, how many words you used, how many mistakes you had. The, the screenshot is just showing you part of uh, the email that I got. And of course, if you're a premium user, they break it down even more for you. But like I said, I'm only using the free portion of it. And I thought, how lovely for students who have emails and can have their email connected to Grammarly to help them really improve their spelling and grammatic use. They will get this weekly email to update them. It's not going to happen with my fourth graders, but it's OK. Okay, for those of you that use Evernote, Evernote Web Clipper is one that you're going to want to use. When you're on a web page that you want to add to your one of your Evernote um, notebooks, you just simply click on the icon. You can um, snip part of the page. You can do the URL. You can do the whole web page, whatever you want to add to your notebook. It's right there. Having um, this for my students enables them to add things to their notebooks quickly. And of course, it, you do need to have an Evernote um, presence in order for that to work. Uh, Clearly is made by Evernote. It's an extension that when you're on a web page, it's got lots of extraneous stuff on either sidebar. You would click on the Clearly um, extension, and it opens it up in a e-reader type format with all of the extraneous um, stuff removed from the website from the web page. Makes it much easier to read. You can change it from um, black on white to white on black or sepia or whatever helps you change the font size, etc. So it's really a nice one to use with your students also. I'm going to skip over this. This is a quick little video that you can go watch. Uh, it's very short and sweet, but um, just showing how clearly works. Bitly is one that I use all the time. If you know me, you know that I'm on Twitter a lot. I find things that I want to share out. And all I have to do is when I'm on a website, I click on my Bitly extension. I click on Share, and it allows me to quickly share a, a bit link out with my users. I can type in a hashtag behind it before I hit um, Share. So it makes my workflow very, very fast and easy. And my students also use this. Uh, an example would be I have a student that wanted to show her blog, share it out with our friends on Twitter. So she would have her blog open. She would click on the Bitly extension. It would open this up. When she clicks on the Share button in the middle, she will get, I'm sorry, she will get um, a message inside there that would allow her to share it out on my Twitter feed. Or if we set it up to go with our class Twitter account, it would be shared on our class Twitter feed. You can also hook it up to Facebook. 
I don't tend to use Facebook quite as much, but it can go to Facebook as well. As far as shorteners go, the Google shortener, Google, is a great one to use. And the reason why I sometimes use it is because I like to be able to get the QR code that is automatically generated when you use Google.gl as your shortener. Um, one of the things that um, I find when I do that, this is an example of a, a long URL and then what it looks like when it's been shortened by Google.gl. And when you click on the QR code, you will get a small version of the QR code. And what I do is click on that. It opens up in its own window. I enlarge it, take a screenshot of it. And then if I add it to a presentation, I can shrink it to fit a slide or into a blog post. And I'm not having to worry about it being pixelated, that I know that it will work properly um, by going from a larger to a smaller size. So a little bit dicey when you go from a small image to a larger one, because sometimes the pixelation will mess with it working properly. Okay, um, Creative Commons Flickr Image Search, that's a really long name, but I had um, presented this for Simple K-12 and just called it Creative Commons and people weren't finding it in the Google, I mean in the Chrome um, extension store, so I had to go back and find the proper name. And again, it allows you to search right within um, create, um, Flickr's Creative Commons licensing when you're, let's say, writing a blog post and you want an image that you know that you're able to use and sh um, share out, that you can do that search right as you're working with on your blog without having to leave it and go to something else. The only thing to remember is that on Flickr, you are not allowed to uh, directly copy and paste. Um, you need to download it. <clears throat> or you can grab a screenshot, but I teach my kids to download it and then to also make sure that they have um, still grabbed the, the URL so that they can cite it and be good digital citizens. You know, even though we're allowed to use it and share it, it's still nice to give attribution to the person whose image we are borrowing. Tab scissors. Have you ever wanted to work with two screens side by side? And there's, of course, different ways to do it, but if you pull one of the tabs off, then you have to resize them and all that. Well, just by <clears throat> hitting the tab scissors icon, it will quickly and cleanly set up your two pages side by side, and it just makes it a nice little way to work um, on two different pages, I'm sorry, two different website pages at the same time. So I like using that. It's quick and easy and just a lot fewer steps than doing it some other way. And then, of course, once you've taken it apart, you want to be able to put them back together quickly. And again, you could drag the tab up and, you know, hook it back in. But an easy way is just to hit the tab glue um, extension icon, and it puts every, all your tabs back together properly up in the, in the bar. Okay, this one is more for my, myself personally, um, but it does benefit my class in the long run. I have my Amazon um, account, um, my Prime account. I took it one step further and I did what's called Amazon Smile. And what you do when you sign up for Amazon Smile is you have part of whatever you spend on Amazon is donated to a charity of your choice that they are partnered with. And in my particular case, my Amazon Smile is connected to Donors Choose. I have been fortunate to have quite a few Donors Choose um, grants fully funded for my classroom. And so I believe in giving back, so I use that one a lot. So anytime I'm um, shopping on Amazon, I just simply click on my Amazon Smile um, extension icon and it opens that page and then I can search you know for whatever I want to buy with inside of Amazon and give back to donors choose. Okay, a word of warning. Do not have too many extensions opened at one time or enabled at one time. 
Um, the beauty of Chrome browser is its speed. That is probably why most of us have chosen it as our go-to browser because we love how fast it is. Well, if you have way too many extensions open, it will um, severely handicap the speed of your browsing experience. So I, my rule of thumb is I generally have around 10 open and uh, try to keep it like that and I can switch back and forth rather quickly. So depending on what particular task I'm doing online, I can enable or um, you know, turn off certain ones. There are some that I keep on all the time. But occasionally I do change them back and forth. All right, that's my contact information, and now for the live demo. And Peggy, uh, as long as I've been doing this, you'd think I would know this. Do I do web tour or do I do application sharing? Well, Paula, this is easy peasy. You click on application sharing, which is the second icon. And you want to be sure to have your browser open um, on your desktop mm -hmm. and select your browser to share. All right, give me one second to set up my browser. Okay. All righty. Okay. Think and it I'm may ready take a that. moment to load. Okay. And then I go here. Okay. Let's see if that's working. All right. And there it is. Good job. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Okay. So let's just do a quick review. Here's my Omnibox. Here's my hamburger icon today. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I have thirteen open, so I'm kind of bending my rules a little bit, but I'll explain why in a moment. All right, just to let you know, Adblock, other than turning it off occasionally, I don't touch Adblock. It just sits there, runs in the background. Same with Grammarly. It runs in the background. Um, when I need it, it comes up and it opens up for me and everything's ready to go. Um, let me go to um, this and go to my blog. All right, so if I wanted to If I was on somebody else's blog and I wanted to add it to my Evernote, I would just simply click on my Evernote and I would get a, a few um, different choices of how I wanted to um, add it to Evernote and then I would choose which notebook I wanted to add it into and it would be saved in my Evernote. So easy way to curate things. Um, as we all know, we're finding things all over the web and we want to be able to curate them and and save them quickly and so I find this is an easy way to do it. Now, to show you clearly, um, as you can see, I have a right sidebar that has some different things on it and when I hit clearly, this is what I get instead. So a much cleaner, nicer, and again I can change it to, you know, different ways to read so that my experience is set up for me. And as you can see, clearly, because it's from Evernote, allows me to click directly into Evernote also. So I would actually get this cleaner version of this particular blog post saved to my Evernote. Okay. Bitly. Again, like I said, I use this constantly on Twitter. I want to share this out as a tweet, so I just quickly click on Bitly. There, it's, it's made a bit for me, a bit link. If I want to customize it, I can. If I want to share it out, there it is. And if I want to add um, live um, class, oops, spell it right, to O before I tweet out, I can do just add that to the end if I have enough characters left and hit tweet, and it's now been tweeted out. Fast and simple to use. Absolutely love it. Okay, if I wanted to generate a QR code to use in a presentation or to share on a website, I would go to goog.gl, click on QR code. There's my QR code. And like I said, I go and you know get 
grab a screenshot of the bigger version just so it's easier to size it better. And I find that very quick and easy to use. In teaching our students, these little um, tips and tricks really help with their workflow also. All right, so Creative Commons. Uh, if I was going to do a new post and I wanted to find a Creative Commons picture to go on the post, I would simply click here, do a search. It would take me directly into Flickr, finding uh, the pictures that were tagged with that particular search term, and I'd be ready to go. All right, let me show you how wherever, whichever one I have open right now, which happens to be my blog, if I would hit tab scissors, it's going to separate my tabs between, oh, let me get rid of this one, between my Symbolu start page and my blog. So if I hit tab scissors, this is what happens. Okay. And then when I'm finished doing, you know, working on both of those pages, doing whatever I have to do, I simply hit tab glue, and all of my tabs are now put together in one nice flow across the top. Um, awesome screenshot is up there. It's one that I use, but I tend not to use it quite as much. I'm on a Mac, so I tend to use the Command Shift 4 to take my screenshots, but for those of you that want to um, have another option, Awesome Screenshot is a good one. There's my Amazon Smile, which um, you know I use a lot. Of course, I'm a Pinterest person, so if I wanted to add something to one of my Pinterest boards, well, that's not a very good one to add. Let me get onto my blog post. Um, you know, and I wanted to add something there, I would just hit my Pinterest icon, pick whichever one I want to pin, you know, where I want to pin it to, and it would be done. Now, you're going to laugh. I just discovered this one this morning thanks to Richard Byrne, Free Technology for Teachers. It's called Announcify. So it was not in my presentation, but I wanted to share it with you. If you have this extension um, added and open, when you click on it, this is what happens. All right, so that's how that works. Again, what a great tool for our students to know about so that they can have websites read to them. So that one I think you're going to want to add to. I saw a bunch of you talking about Extensify. Is that, am I saying that one right? Which it quickly enables you to uh, manage your extensions. If you go here, you would go to More Tools, Extensions, and here's my list with the ones that are enabled, the ones that are there but not enabled, and I can quickly turn them on and off from there or just by clicking on them here. So that's one way. And then, of course, if I want more, all I have to do is scroll. Sorry, I know that's driving me crazy. I'm scrolling too fast. I can go to more extensions right here and go into the Google Chrome extension store and find other ones to help me. Okay? So let me go back and I'll take questions in just a minute, but I just wanted to clarify some of the search tools, I mean tricks that I use. Okay. And the one that I really want to demonstrate is let me go to, I'm sorry, let me go to Google Images. Okay. So I'm on the Google Images page. And I am going to get rid of all the stuff that I have open. Sorry about that. Okay. So here I am on the Google image page. And I am going to take, uh, let me see. I lost it. Oh, there it is. It's hiding. Okay, I'm going to grab this image. Now look what happens. 
the second I grab this image, you'll notice how this search the query box, sorry, opens up and I can just drag my image and drop it. And it is going to go find it for me. And that is called the reverse image search. Isn't that awesome? I love using that. I love demoing that. It is so much fun in so many nice ways. Like I said, when I have forgotten to cite my sources, it has come in so handy. All right, suppose I wanted to find a picture of a flower. And of course, when I do that, what do I get? I get gazillion res results sent back. So if I come over here to the advanced search bar, um, I'm sorry, gear, one of the things that I need to teach my students is how to do the advanced search. And I have them scroll down. They can change the color. Let's say that um, their favorite color is orange. So they're going to get results that are orange. And right now, it is the usage is not filtered. So I want to make sure that I get images that are free to use and share. So I'm going to click on that and then do an advanced search. So now that the images that are coming back are not only orange, but they are labeled for non-commercial use, reuse. If I wanted to change that, I could change it and update my search results. And it didn't change a whole lot more, but there you go. So I love being able to do that. Like I said, I use um, this a lot, the color, when I'm doing um, images that I need to add to um, handouts or things that I'm going to put on the copy machine at school. So I tend to change it to black and white and use it a lot. One of the, one of the advanced search um, options that left just recently, and we all need to write into Google and get it back, they used to have one for readability levels. And you could actually set the readability for um, low to high. And I used that a lot. We took it away, so it's really sad that it's gone. Also, you want to know about safe search, adding that, um, having that enabled on your devices will help filter out a lot of the stuff you don't want your kids seeing when they're searching on Google. Um, so that's a great thing. And I know I'm just about out of time, and I'm hoping that there's some questions that need to be answered. So I need to get quiet and um, see what I can do as far as answering questions for you. Yes, Paula, I did capture many questions. Um, going back to the beginning, and it's, this starts out with newbie concern. I'm not sure if this person is new to extensions or not, but I'll, I'll read it the way you typed it. Security and privacy exposures as a consequence of installing and running extensions. Do extensions affect the security of the um, internet? I forgot to click on talk. I have to, um, for some of the extensions that I use, I have to have a, um, I have to be logged in. Like for Bitly, you, I actually have mm -hmm. an account with Bitly. For Evernote, I have an account. So there are certain extensions that you know are um, that work through their email process. And because I teach children that don't have email access, um, mm -hmm. when we are doing extensions, I will tend to log into my Google account, which will load my Google extensions, and everything that they do will be added to my browsing history. So. Hoping that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Thanks. Um, Going to scroll up here. Um, would with the site search, would putting 
words in quotes, like you had the blue room at the White House, for instance, would that make a difference? Yes, any time that you can um, enclose a search um, within quotes, it will keep that term together, which will bring back just blue room results, not blue, mm -hmm. and then room, and then blue room results also. So yes, that is definitely one you want to also teach your, your kids how to do. Okay. If the extensions are enabled, uh, do they all automatically appear in the browser, or do you have to enable them yes. each time? Um, no. Every time I log into um, a, a computer, oh, and that's another thing I want to say. Um, you know, normally it's your browsing on your computer, but let's say I went to school and I went into the computer lab and I logged into my um, Gmail. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a moment for my Gmail account to open because it's going to also load all of my extensions that I have enabled as I am trying to do my Gmail. So that's another reason why you don't want to tunnel them opened at one time because it will open each and every one of them on, it, on the computer that you're using. Okay. Uh, does Grammarly work with Google Docs? Um, gosh, I don't remember. I, I use Google Docs all the time. Let's see. Um, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. Well, since it's a browser no, extension, it might not. Right, yeah. It's in the browser, right? Because you know, you just have to use your tools within Google um, Docs mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. now. This is for when you're on um, a website. Okay. So, I'm sorry, I didn't keep up with the chat as, a, as we were going. No, that's okay. I, I don't do that well. So. Do, do <laughs> some extensions? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So, oh, do some extensions extensions slow down Chrome more than others? I would imagine that there are some that are um, more, you know, would do that more. But mm -hmm. I have not found any information as to how to decipher that. I don't understand mm -hmm. the back end of all of it very well, so I, I really can't right. answer that. But my, aunt, my my thought would be, yes, yeah, some of them are more of a workhorse, so they would be taking more, um, you know, whatever it's needed to work properly. Right. Tammy, yes, I do use Google Docs in my classroom often, but like I said before, because of the age of my students, they are working off mm -hmm. of my um, Google Docs uh, login. Um, we are not a GAF School Google Apps for Education at this point in time. So everything that my students do because of their age, I have a couple that have their own um, Gmail accounts. The parents have allowed that, but most of them are working off of my accounts. Now one person typed something about QR codes possibly losing momentum, and then somebody asked what was the favorite QR code reader. So it probably is, is some think that QR codes are falling out of fashion and that they haven't yet. Um, I guess the question is, what have you found? I use SCAN, S-C-A-N. Um, that's mm -hmm. the one that I know there are quite a few available, but I just like that Scan, you don't even have to like get it perfectly lined up on your mobile device for it to work. It just really is a great one for grabbing QR codes. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain again what Announceify does? I think as you were demonstrating, part of it we didn't get. Oh, okay. Announceify actually um, clears the 
the website. It puts it into an e-reader format and then actually reads the page oh. to you. And okay. it, what it, 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 it blocks out. It only does one paragraph at a time, so it kind of like grays out the paragraphs below what it's reading. Mm -hmm. Great. Someone saw that you had Spritzlet bookmarklet installed. What is Spritzlet? Spritzlet helps you develop your reading speed. And um, because it, uh, you set it, well, I, I think it has you do, it's been a while since I've used it. I want to say it puts you through a little um, test at the beginning and kind of mm -hmm. helps you determine your reading speed. And then you can, if you continue to use it, it gradually increases your reading speed. Because what it does is it shows up at the top of your browser page with like, maybe three words at a time, and then eventually it'll go to four, and it's constantly moving. <laughs> so you have to be able to uh, pay attention. So it's one that I don't use that often. I played around with it just to see um, if I would, if it would be one that I would you know, like. And I will probably go back and play with it some more, but I haven't used it enough to really know its complete workings in and out. Mm -hmm. And somebody's asking, does it recognize different languages? But I'm not quite sure what it is, Joe. Maybe you can type that in. Oh, the, the Spritzlet. Um, I'm not sure. I really couldn't answer that. But it it was fun to play with, and it was um, I just as a joke, I kind of like bumped the speed up really fast, like double what I mm -hmm. what is my normal reading speed. And I got very frustrated. It was like I can't read that fast. <laughs> so for someone who is trying to um, increase their reading speed, it would be something to check out. Mm -hmm. Can you spell the name of the app for us in chat? Uh, oh, Joe did. Let Thank me you, see Joe. If I can find. Joe okay, did. There you go. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, there was another question yeah, uh, here. Like I oh, said, there. I'm sorry. There are so many extensions out there, just like there are so many apps. So mm -hmm. my best suggestion is to find some people that um, you know and follow online and ask them. We actually play a game um, when we uh, go to presentations. And people are sharing their desktop. We like to do this mm -hmm. like in the discovery community. We'll sit there and we'll look at their little icons and go, okay, I recognize it. Okay, what's that icon? The third one from the left, you know, so that we're learning new extensions when oh, we're sure. sitting in uh, webinars. It's really, it's like, we've never seen that one. What's that one do? You tell us about that one. So mm -hmm. it's a good way to, to figure out which ones to help install for you. Sure, and someone asked, can you show us how to enable and disable them again? Uh, sure can. Give me a second. Let me get to the right spot before I go to app sharing. All right, so, okay, I think I'm set up and ready. All right, so. All right, so this is your Omnibox. These are my extensions. This is the hamburger icon. Um, if I click here, I'm going down to more tools, and then I'm going to extensions. And it's just as simple as clicking in the box or not. And you have an alphabetical listing of all the extensions that you have added to your browser. And know that there are extensions from, I believe, all the browsers. So, you know, you might want to do a search for if you're a Firefox user. So a lot of these are uh, work across the browsers, but there are some that are specific for particular browsers. So just, you know, go to that browser store and see what's available. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, showing you what I have on and what I, you know, turned on and what I haven't turned on. And there mm -hmm. were, when I was getting ready to do the presentation, there were quite a few that I actually threw in the trash can, got rid of. 
Sure. So I was like, I haven't used that one in a long time, so it needs to go away. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. So you have the hamburger icon. Also on Adblock, you can simply click on Adblock. Like I said, when you get on a website and sometimes you have to pause Adblock, mm -hmm. you can do it just by clicking on the icon. Okay? So that's a quick way to do it also. Sure, yeah. And yes, Carolyn, when you trash them, you can always go retrieve it again. Yeah, just go back and just go back and add it back into your browser. Yeah. Thanks so much, Paula. Those were all the questions. Glad, the to, glad to be here. Hope it helps everybody. And um, enjoy your weekend, everyone. I'll turn the mic over to Peggy, who will do the upcoming shows for us. Thank you so much, Paula. That was awesome. And there's so many new things we all have to explore now that I know I'm going to be going back and listening to the recording so I can pause it and try it as I go along. That was great. Just a quick um, introduction to what's coming up next. We're very excited to have Tammy Pogue as our August featured teacher next week. She's a high school English teacher who uses lots of technology in her classroom and one of our regular um, contributors and active participants with our advisory team. So thank you, Tammy, for doing that for us. On August 22nd, we're going to have Valerie Burton back, and she's going to focus on student-created responses to text reading using a lot of different tools to show you how students can respond to things that they're reading. So that'll be fascinating. Also, just to let you know, September 5th, we won't have a show uh, because that is the Labor Day holiday weekend in the U.S. So we'll ho we hope that you'll come back and join us for all of our upcoming shows. We love having you with us. Also want to let you know that there's a great event coming up that's brand new and it's just a one it's a it's a four day event called Teacher Entrepreneurship Week from August 24th to the 27th and it's going to be evenings only. Steve Hargadon is bringing back his amazing interviews and he's going to be interviewing a lot of really outstanding educators on the subject of creation and change. So it's totally free. It, this link is in the live binder, so you can find it there and sign up. Um, it's all going to be done in Google Hangouts. So check it out. I think that they're only going to be like 20, 30 minutes long. They're not like full hour uh, webinars. But look at that lineup. You'll see lots of names that you recognize there. Many, almost all, are people that we have been following regularly. So I hope you'll join us for that August 24th to 27th. And now I'll take it back to you, um, Lori, to wrap it up. All right, Peggy. You can nominate a featured teacher, like Tammy will be for next week by filling out the form that you can find here at this website. Peggy will also drop the link into the chat. Um, you can nominate yourself for, as a featured teacher for the month as well. The form is also in the live binder for the month in the resources section. When you exit the show, the survey should open up inside your browser. It's at this URL. You can also take the link from the chat box, or you can take the tab in the Live Binder to get to the survey. Once you complete the survey at the bottom, you'll find two fields to request the professional development certificate. And for the past few months, these, when you get this back, your name is actually printed on their certificate as you typed it in that box. Please, though, when you type in your email address, it is a personal email address and not a school email. 
because the school sites tend to block you from receiving this. The video collection and audio collection are both in iTunes U, so you can listen to archives or watch archives from a, uh, an Apple mobile device. The archives are also in an RSS feed that you can subscribe to with this link on the website page. You can also see the full recording here. Again, special thanks to Paula Noggle, our special guest for today, to Steve Harkadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming today. Bye-bye.